Jay's doing it, I'd like to welcome you to NMTC's latest installment of our 126th anniversary commemoration of the founding of D.C. Thank you all for coming out of the rain. I'd like to thank our host, Buzz Boys and Poets, for allowing us to use their space.
Sue Taylor started to hit me in the Civil War Court. Known today as the Fort Circle Park System. Tanya Washington Stern serves as a planner in today's District of Columbia. She rewards the University of the District of Columbia will moderate the discussion. We look forward to an evening of conversation and celebration, not debate about this topic. We hope that everyone's views will be respected and heard. So I, what I'd like to do first is introduce each, each of the panelists, and they're going to stand up one at a time and do PowerPoint presentations. I'd like to begin by recognizing Dean Harris. Next, I'd like to recognize Sue Taylor. <laughs> Sue is a public anthropologist in residence at American University, and she's the principal investigator for the African American Civil War Descendants Project. I'd next like to recognize Tanya Washington Stern. Tanya is the deputy director of planning, engagement, and design at the East Office of Planning. Finally, I'd like to recognize Cherie Ward. Dr. Ward is professor, professor of speech at the University of District of Columbia Community College. I'd like to thank you Good evening, everyone. How are you? It's a rainy Thursday evening. You can do better than that. How are you? That's what I'm talking about. I am Dr. Cherie Ward, a professor of public speaking at the University of District of Columbia. I recently finished my doctoral studies at Howard University in the Department of Communications, Culture, and Media Studies with a specialization in special education. My passion is poetry. So you're going to get a little bit of that tonight with your humanity. And uh, my research involved using poetry as a communication multimodality to encourage reading engagement in selected Af African American learners with my learning disabilities. I'm a former Miss District of Columbia, 1985, so I'm part of the history of this city. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's humanity. Let's give all of our panelists some applause. So our first speaker for tonight is Dean. Please come up and give your presentation. Thank you, Sheree. The Gummer C. Meggs is uh, probably the most important man, one of the most important men that you've never heard of, which is too bad because he was extremely influential and important, especially in the history of Washington, D.C. But uh, if, if there's only one thing you take away from tonight, it is that Beggs is the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> As designer of the Washington water supply, his motto is don't stay thirsty, my friends. Beggs was, uh, was a West Point trained engineer who worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, next, please. Came to Washington in uh, the early 1850s to build a new water supply system. Next, please. He also was responsible for the uh, great new dome of the Capitol building and the extension of the wings. Uh, also in charge of the General Post Office, which is today's Hotel Monaco. Next, please. Uh, in the 1870s, the uh, U.S. Uh, National Museum was built next to the Smithsonian Castle. Uh, Adolf Kluge is the architect, but it's based on a design first submitted by May. Next and then just for fun, in retirement, he designed, planned, designed, and built uh, the Pension Building, which is today's uh, National Building Museum, one of the great interior spaces in the country. Next one. On top of all that, Meggs was Quartermaster General during the Civil War. Uh, Meggs was a logistics genius. Uh, he did tremendous feats in supplying the vast and far flung Union Army. Uh, if there is one person who can be credited with uh, being the most critical person for the Union victory in the war, other than Abraham Lincoln, Meggs is your man. Next person. Uh, also, Arlington Cemetery, I don't have time to talk about it, ask about that later. Next. Uh, 
Washington Aqueduct was a system uh, 16 miles started uh, at the Potomac River at Great Falls on the Maryland side. Ran roughly uh, under what is now McCarthy Boulevard. Uh, it ended up in the center of the city, uh, 16 miles long. Next, please. Uh, I shaded in yellow the original water lines uh, uh, from the Washington Aqueduct. And of course, the water was coming in from the west, so uh, water supply was, was best in the western side of the city. Uh, the eastern side really didn't get connected fully until the 1880s. So Belford, of course, began on the west side in Georgetown, the expansion on that side. Uh, next, please. Uh, and of course, it's a trend that's continued today. This is a map from 1873 showing road improvements, uh, paving streets, and of course, mostly on the west side. Next, please. This is a map from 1885 shows water mains and uh, hydrants, fire hydrants in the city. And again, the concentration mostly on the west side. This is photograph uh, in January of 1859. This is the first time that water can be released from the uh, Washington Aqueduct into a fountain on the ground of U.S. Capitol. That's our man Meg standing proudly on the right on top of the fountain. Uh, he realized the uh, importance of the Aqueduct and never wanted to hide his life. Uh, he wrote in a letter about this woman to his father. Next verse. I wish you could see my jet of water in the Capitol Park. I look upon it with constant pleasure, for it seems the spring rejoicing in the air and proclaiming its arrival with the free use of the sick and well, rich and poor, gentle and simple, old and young, for generation after generation, which will have come to rise up in all of us. even had his name cast as risers in the steps of the building uh, in the Aqueduct system. So your homework is to memorize this definition. Every man is the most interesting man in the world. Don't stay thirsty, my friends. Let's give me another round of applause. It's a conversation. My job is to keep every speaker at five minutes because the whole idea of this is to engage you, our audience, in thought-provoking conversation and a couple of humanity drinks. You feel me? <laughs> I you feel me. All right, next up is our next panelist, Sue Taylor. Give a round of applause, please. Service. The forts and batteries are on private property. 
and others of men. <coughs> Fort Reno, which you may be familiar with, is located in Timbertown in North Northwest. It was the highest location in the city, and it provided a view so that when the Confederate troops started marching into Washington, they, cut, they uh, stood up some dust on these dirty roads. And from Fort Reno, that's what triggered uh, and, and led them to know that the Confederates were coming north into uh, the city in July of 1864. They were aiming to attack Fort Stevens. Fort Stevens was on land that was taken from Elizabeth Proctor Thomas to construct the fort. And according to what it says up there, she was called Aunt Betty, and she was a former slave. And uh, she essentially uh, for her freedom, she was a, a, a land owner in Brightwood, and they decided to take her home, and it was Abraham Lincoln who came by her house and said, you know, it's going to be all right. So after the war, apparently she got her track on that. Fort Stevens had the necessary artillery. Uh, to curtail the enemy. There was a battle at Fort Stevens, and that's one of them that was just mentioned earlier. Uh, it was July the 11th to the 12th in 1864, and this is the closest that Washington, D.C. came to be take, overtaken by the Confederates. The Confederate Army was led by Jubal Irby. Uh, President Lincoln decided to visit the fort. So he went to Fort Stevens on July the 12th. And what you see in this slide is that a man next to him was shot. And someone said to Lincoln, get down, fool. Um, <laughs> We, had, we don't know for sure who said that. Someone has said it was all for Wendell Holmes. We're not sure we think it was for Wendell Holmes. Even though he was in the Army, he, he may not have been there at the time. But anyway, Jubal Early was surprised by the fort. What we had was really um, a good force there at Fort Stevens, even though it was small. And what we found is that they did engage in some skirmishes, and the dead from that skirmish are buried across the street, basically, on Battleground National Cemetery. Okay. The war ended in 1865, and the War Department retained some of these forts until 1925. And then in 1933, uh, it came under the administration of the Department of the Interior, and the National Park Service took over. In 1968, the uh, National Park Service is the one that decided to link these forts. And essentially, they were linked, and they were called the Fort Circle Parks. And today, they form essentially uh, the neighborhoods. And what you have is a handout, I think, over there that's similar to that, maybe. But anyway, the forts are now part of the neighborhoods that are around the city. And the Civil War defenses continue to be part of the overall plan of the city. The fortifications surrounded the city added to this work history. Uh, Let's give Sue Taylor a great round of applause. Thank you, thank you. By the way, did everyone get the map that she provided for us? Can you sign in? Yeah. Yes? Did everyone sign in? No. 
No, please make sure before you leave sign in, how will we know that you attended and how will we keep in touch with you for our future humanities? Y'all having a good time tonight? Oh, come on now, get up. It's Thursday night. Good. I hope you are writing your questions down because after our final panelist, Ms. Tanya Stern, who will be coming up to the mic next, at that time, we are going to field questions to our audience, and I hope you are prepared to give and give and take exchange so that we all can have a learning experience. And at that time, Mr. Jay Stewart will come around with the microphone to address your questions. At this time, give it up for Ms. Tanya Stern. Part of this quote, because um, it really gets to what 
we see as what planning inclusivity is about. Uh, growing inclusively means that individuals and families are not confined to particular economic and geographic boundaries, but are able to make important choices. Choices about where they live, how and where they earn a living, how they get around the city, and where their children go to school. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we create plans um, now. Again, this is very different from how the Grumman Bikes did his work. He pretty much said, this is what I want, and <laughs> he made it happen. Uh, but we don't work that way. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, this is an image of the, the comprehensive plan. So we actually look at a lot of different models in terms of planning for the city. We do citywide plans. We also do a lot of neighborhood level plans. We work with a lot of communities in the city um, and have created 20 plus plans uh, since the early 2000s uh, with different neighborhoods in the city. Uh, we also do more corridor focused plans, for instance, uh, we're completing one in the Van Ness neighborhood uh, by UDC focused on that part of Connecticut Avenue, and we also plan a large site like uh, Walter Reed. So just really quickly about how we, how we actually plan. Um, why create a plan? Again, what we look at are, are there issues or challenges or are there opportunities in the city that really need some focused attention? Next slide. So in terms of our process, we always start with data. Uh, we actually house the district state data center, so if you ever want demographic or population data for the city, we have it. Next slide. We also engage the community throughout the process. Uh, a fundamental aspect of how we do planning is that we start with the community. We talk with them. What we develop works is has to address their needs and what we uh, fundamentally come up with, with a, uh, in terms of a plan, has to be something that's embraced by the community we're working with. Next slide. We also do a lot of analysis. We do spatial analysis in terms of land use, but we also look at a lot of policies, citywide policies that the district already has. Next slide. And then finally, we develop solutions for the community. This is uh, a couple of examples from our Southwest Neighborhood Plan that we completed last year. Um, and again, our plans go through a whole very robust public process, but ultimately, once we complete our plans, we turn them over to the community um, to, to make sure that, that the plans actually get implemented. Thank you very much. You know, every time a speaker finishes, don't accept it. Yes, yes, yes. Well, now, first of all, I hope you know that we have a specialized drink tonight called the Humanitini. So you must be sure and order it because it might liberate your expressions to ask more questions and interact in interesting dialogue. So I hope you have your questions ready. How many people have a question right now? Oh, come on. How many people have a question? That gentleman and this lady, please stand up. I'm going to turn the mic over to Mr. Jay Stewart, who will come to you for you to ask your question, and our panelists will take them as you ask them. I just want to take a minute to give the panelists time to get up to the stage. You guys can have a seat up there. And who had the first question? Gentlemen, stand up. Oh, this lady in the middle. Where is it? I would say two seconds. How? Hello? Hello? How the neighborhoods? Uh, help with your planning? I mean, what is the mechanism? Is it through the ANCs? Um, how do you even get started on the concept? What do you mean by a plan for the neighborhood, anyway? What does that mean? Uh, planning what? Planning streets, traffic lights, uh, sidewalks? Um, how do you get the vision? Of, you know, everybody's uh, presentation was so short. I wondered if somebody, if, if the people could talk about the actual pieces of the planning and how the communities themselves provide input. So I can address that. 
So I can address that question. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through kind of a typical process that we do for our small area plans, which is a typical type of neighborhood plan. Um, and to go back to your first question, basically, what do we plan? Do we plan sidewalks? No, we don't. We don't necessarily plan sidewalks. Um, with land use planning, what we focus on, particularly for a neighborhood, is working with residents and other stakeholders in that community to develop a vision for what they want their neighborhood to be in the future. Part of that may involve preserving great things that work now and what are strategies around that that are related to land use. Um, in other cases, there may be challenges. Um, there may be problems that people see in their communities and so they want to figure out what can we do, what uh, solutions can we propose to try to fix those things in the future. In other cases, we've done uh, plans where um, there isn't a whole lot that's there right now. Um, one instance is uh, we're completing a plan for the Buzzard Point neighborhood, which is then um, just uh, south of where we completed our southwest plan. And right now, it's mostly industrial. But that area was completely rezoned uh, by the Zoning Commission about 10 years ago to be uh, ultimately a moderate to mixed use, uh, uh, sorry, moderate to high density mixed use neighborhood with residences and commercial. Um, parks, recreation, the whole the whole nine yards is basically what can happen there in the future. And so what we do is we work to create a vision, determine what are the goals that people want to achieve um, in terms of what their neighborhood is going to look like, what types of uh, amenities are going to be there, um, are there um, housing needs, or typically are housing needs, affordable housing is always a big issue, are there transportation issues. We look at retail, we look at parks and recreation, so we look at a lot of different components. In terms of specifically how we work with the communities, we always involve the, the ANC, um, but we don't work just through the ANC. Uh, we typically have an advisory committee of, of key neighborhood stakeholders. We have uh, public meetings throughout the entire process so that anyone from the community uh, can come in, uh, find out about the project, and tell us what they want to see. Um, and we do those meetings periodically throughout the entire process. At the very beginning when we're starting, uh, midway when we have some draft recommendations so that we can get feedback on whether or not this makes sense. We always release draft plans uh, for public feedback, so we always get a lot of feedback then as well and do public engagement. And then finally, we actually complete the plan and that's pretty much how we finish the process. But, but generally speaking, um, we host our own meetings, but we also get invited to ANC meetings uh, to talk about our plans. There are community organizations that invite us. Uh, we've, we've done uh, pop-up sessions at you know, diners in the neighborhood. We do a lot of different things to try to reach out to the community um, because fundamentally, you know, we don't do top-down planning anymore in the city in terms of land use planning. So whatever we come up with, it, we, we do not actually implement plans. We don't build streets, we don't build buildings. Others are, are responsible for actually implementing these things, and so we have to make sure that when we complete the plan and turn it over, that there's, uh, there are stakeholders and there are people in the community who have buy-in and feel like this is my plan and I want to make sure it's actually going to happen. Did that answer your question? Well, it's <laughs> uh, Next, sir. <laughs> And, and just before this gentleman takes the mic, the young lady said that the presentations were so short. As I said to you earlier, the design of a humanitini is that our panelists basically give you a brief description of their professional expertise on the time period at hand, but it's really about you, the community, and your interaction and give and take with our panelists. So that's why we kept the speaker so short, so that you can chime in and be part of the conversation. Next question, please. Thank you. My name is Jerome Page, and my question is to Dean, our man Megs. Two questions in two parts. So what can we learn from him today that we can apply today? And also, if he were alive today, what issues would he be addressing at the time? Uh, good questions. Uh, I think uh, one, Megs was scrupulously honest, which would be a great trait today. Uh, <laughs> uh, he 
did have a big ego, which is somewhat common now, but uh, he had uh, achievements to back that up. Uh, I think um, he had amazing confidence in his abilities. He also was probably, although now it's uh, not allowed by government employees, he probably was the greatest, greatest lobbyist of his day. Uh, he was able to get money for his projects, mainly because he had such great relationships with Congress. Uh, I showed you the slide of the uh, uh, water entering the fountain. Uh, and it was not by accident that the first release of water was on the ground of the U.S. Capitol. He made sure that his primary sponsors were standing on uh, the, the, uh, the, the steps of the Capitol, uh, by the way, of the extension that he had just built or was building, standing there watching as the water was released. Uh, he was no dummy. Uh, today, I think he would still be distressed about the quality of the water. And I think he would be working uh, on still trying to improve uh, the quality and the delivery of the, of, of the water. Um, he's primary. Do we have another question from the audience? Sir. Gentlemen, yes. And then keep your hands up, please. Okay. Just a, Good. I have some places to go. Just a couple of quick uh, historical questions. You said you would address uh, Arlington Cemetery. You might want to say something about that. Uh, the famous Aquaduct Bridge over the Parker Boulevard. But the other thing is, uh, many of you know that the Meigs family is still here. Uh, I think there was a Sidwell and General Meigs, the recent one, who was in charge of uh, the IED uh, investigations in Iraq. Have they had any contact with any of them? Uh, unfortunately, I have not made contact. Uh, I, I have through the Rogers side of the family. Uh, but I haven't had a chance, although I do know uh, a friend of mine knows Meigs that I need to uh, talk to. Uh, I, I'd like to talk with you if you have any contacts with him. And of course, the recent military general, his name, of course, was a member of CMAGS, for our tradition. Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, the, the, the photo of the uh, bridge that I showed, uh, that carries Pennsylvania Avenue over Rock Creek. And that was a very innovative design. Uh, if you remember, the tubular arch not only carried water for the aqueduct, it also was the arch for the bridge. And in fact, uh, those arches are still there. Um, they're now encased in concrete, and they no longer carry the bridge. But they're still there, and as far as I know, at least until recently, they still carry water. Uh, Arlington Cemetery, uh, Megs, as Quartermaster General, he was in charge of arranging for burials of soldiers. Uh, Washington uh, was getting uh, the needed to find space outside of the city for the burials. Uh, and he chose uh, Arlington, suggested uh, the former estate of Robert E. Lee for the burials. Uh, he made sure and uh, dug up the uh, gardens to put uh, many of the graves. Uh, I have to say, he, um, he was particularly bitter at his former friends and fellow soldiers and even employees who fought for the Confederacy. Now, Meg's son himself was killed in the war. Of course, only made Mags even more heartbroken and bitter. Uh, and for example, when the Cavendon Bridge was completed, uh, when it was uh, first uh, completed, he had a plaque placed on the bridge that mentioned that it had started uh, when Jefferson Davis, the Secretary of War, uh, who Mags had worked for, and was instrumental in helping fund the bridge. He also mentioned uh, his assistant, Alfred Reeves, who was extremely important in building the Cabin John Bridge and the Aqueduct. Once the Civil War started, however, he was so embittered that he had their names removed from the plaque. And it wasn't until the turn of the 20th century that they added uh, some of those names back. Uh, so uh, after the war, I know that Alfred Reeves came to Washington, tried to see Megs. Uh, Megs refused to see him. Uh, he was so still angry. So I, I, it's hard not to believe there wasn't some personal animus in uh, placing the cemetery in the, uh, on the grounds where I believe was the state. Okay, next question. Is anyone interpreting his uh, Civil War diary? I 
kind of would be. <laughs> Although you, you use that shorthand technique, and nobody's been able to translate that. You're doing that. Oh no, no, it's been um, actually most of his diaries are from the 1850s. During the war, he had very little time to actually write his diaries, which is too bad because uh, his diaries from the 1850s were incredibly full of information, uh, fascinating information. And several years ago. Uh, the uh, architect of Capitol's office, curator of architects of Capitol's office, and they funded the transcription by one of the uh, folks, few folks left who could actually read that type of, of shorthand. Uh, it was a very massive project, but they have completed that. And I know the, the uh, entries dealing with the Capitol have been published by the I think the Senate. Yeah, that book only goes to 1861. It stops there. Well, I don't think there was, I don't think he uh, continued his diaries during the war. As I said, he was a little too busy to, uh, to do that. And again, that's unfortunate because he, uh, he liked to talk a lot about his projects when he had the time. Okay, we're going to take this young lady right here. <laughs> right here. Isn't this a wonderful conversation? Yeah, yeah. I can't tell. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Give, give some a Thank you all. I had a question um, about the city planning in particular, and I wanted to know about how are community members targeted in the development of the future direction for that community? More specifically, how is socioeconomic status considered? And looking at the, the recent changes in the development of the city, um, how are the members, um, more working class and lower income members, how are they included in those plans as many have been priced out of being able to live and afford housing in DC? So affordable housing is a really big issue for the city, um, across the entire city. And um, in terms of looking at um, income levels of households, again, uh, when I mentioned that it's part of our process, when, even when we start plans, we always look at data. What's actually going on in that community? That's definitely something that we look at. Uh, we actually, um, that's part of the information that we, that we get from the Census Bureau. We really do take a hard look at what are the income levels um, in a neighborhood, what are um, you know, job access issues, um, affordable housing, again, is a big issue. And so what we do is we really, when we, when we do the community engagement, we, we try to work really hard to make sure that um, the community knows about the process and we try to engage as many people as possible. We try to work through um, community leaders to try to engage people. Um, that's what it, sometimes can be a challenge because people are busy, people have other responsibilities. Um, but in terms of it, those things being issues, we are very, very aware of that. Um, particularly with regards to, to housing, uh, pretty much all of our plans address housing issues, affordable housing issues, um, the, the sizes of the housing, um, for instance, um, again in our Southwest Neighborhood Plan, um, there was definitely a strong, um, a strong desire from the community to protect the public housing that's there right now, to maintain that, to ensure that there is a diversity of housing choices, not only in the cost of the housing, but even the size of the houses. Um, we hear a lot from residents about the need for family-sized housing because there are a lot of newer buildings going up with, you know, studios and one and two, one and two bedroom apartments. Um, and so that's definitely a big issue that we hear from the community. And what we try to do is, as we, as we work with the community to develop solutions um, that are tailored to particular neighborhoods, we try to figure out what are the tools that um, the district government has that we can leverage. Um, in some neighborhoods, we have more tools than in others. For example, again, in Southwest, um, the DC Council passed a law about a year and a half or so ago, basically saying that, um, for instance, there's another agency that um, is a district government is disposing of land to be developed. If, that, if those properties are within a quarter mile of a metro rail station, then whoever develops that property is required to provide 30% affordable housing. So that is something that is specifically referenced in the Southwest plan is saying, not only are you, you're, just, you're required to do this, and making sure that there is um, a, a sufficient supply of affordable housing is something that's very important in this community. But there are some other neighborhoods where the district government doesn't own land and doesn't have that tool, 
And so we have to rely on um, inclusionary zoning and, and the, the number of units we can get from that. So it, the, the sort of the levers that we can pull, we try to pull them when we can and put those in our plans and also try to, um, even where, for instance, um, like I said, the district government doesn't own the land, so we can't directly say you have to provide this much. We try to put in the right um, language and the right strategies to enable, uh, for instance, if, uh, uh, if a developer wants to do a planned unit development application that goes before the zoning commission, uh, we have another arm of our agency that reviews those cases and provides um, recommendations to the zoning commission. And so they can also push in that direction and encourage the zoning commission to encourage um, the provision of, of more affordable housing. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but we try to, to, to use as many different tools as we can. Okay, great response. Let's bring Ms. Taylor back into the conversation by asking, how many of the 68 fortifications uh, originally designed by Mays are there still in existence? Well, <laughs> they aren't, uh, except Fort Stevens is the only one in the district that has sort of been reconstructed as um, what it was like during the Civil War. What you will find now are things that, if you're not looking for them, you won't even recognize them. Earth uh, works that are there, uh, which is, is just sitting a mound in, in the, the ground, essentially, that you wouldn't know if that's what it was. The earthworks were things that protected people from bullets uh, much better than anything else. So. Uh, during the Civil War, you would get down beyond this earth, which is just a mound of earth, and it would be protected somewhere. So you'll still see some of that. Uh, the, the problem we have right now is that many of, of the forts are overgrown with vegetation. Uh, some of them um, are in wooded areas. Others, like Fort Reno, has become essentially a ballpark and place for a concert. So now, you know, they are not what they were at all, and you wouldn't even recognize them. Um, the only things I can think of would be, um, actually, um, that, that, no, there's nothing that really resembles what it was. Fort Tottenham, for example, to me when I moved here was a metro stop. I had no idea that there were all of these forts here. Now for the project we're doing, and the reason that the map that you have only has eight on them, we're only looking at eight. There were, there are nine, there were 68, 19 currently are managed by the National Park Service, and we're only looking at eight of those. So it's, uh, there's a big project. We're hoping to involve community people and get them involved in learning their own history uh, a little more uh, and sharing their information with us. Okay, it seems like we still have a lot farther to go. Next question from the audience. Let's take this lady right here. We're back here. Okay, let's see. Who has the mic? Okay, all right. Give it up. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my question, you mentioned inclusionary zoning with regard to planning. And my question is, what is the cutoff base for inclusionary zoning as far as people's income? I have people who have come to me and said that they have to be making the D.C minimum of $32,000 and $38,000 a year. And a lot of the people who are being forced out of this neighborhood don't make that money, but they're struggling and they're trying to raise their children. And um, I mean, $32,000 is not a lot of money mm -hmm. in, in the full scope of things, but um, the inclusionary zoning, how does that help people who are making less than that? So I will tell you, I am not an expert on inclusionary zoning. Uh, we have a housing planner on our staff um, who knows all the ins and outs of exactly how that works, um, in, including all the different levels in terms of the income levels. Um, and so, unfortunately, I can't directly answer your question now, but I'm happy to give you my card and follow up with you and make sure you get that information. Thank you. Okay, next question. 
Thank you all so much for presenting this evening. I think DC is such a fascinating city and I'm new to the town. And I'd love to hear from each of you um, a little nugget of a, a factoid or an interesting piece of information that we may not know about the city. Okay, we're going to start with the D and go around our here. Interesting fact about the city. Uh, let me think of one. As <laughs> you might not know. Um, well, did you know that the National Park Service owns those three golf courses? <laughs> they're, uh, they're very old, actually, historic golf courses. Uh, East Potomac Park, Rock Creek Park, and Langston. And Langston, in particular, is extremely important for segregate, desegregation of uh, facilities. Uh, recreation facilities uh, in the capital. And in fact, we're doing a study now on all three courses uh, to reveal that history uh, and the importance of recreation and desegregated uh, recreation in the city. Okay, next, Ms. Taylor. Well, I don't know if I can answer your question or not. I've only been here 20 years. So I'm a, kind of a newcomer, uh, and I'm learning as much about Washington as everybody else, I think. So, um, and I think the thing, if you're new to it, then the history of U Street, if you, if you aren't familiar with that, that is something that you should learn about. U Street at one time used to be called Black Broadway. Uh, and it was the places, essentially, that African Americans performed because they couldn't other places. Also, one of the things you may not know about Washington, D.C., which was happened in other societies, too, if I wanted a hat, I couldn't go downtown to the department store and get a hat. But I couldn't try it on uh, because I'm African American. If uh, and so many, U Street and this whole neighborhood around here had businesses. Uh, they had, it was almost independent uh, with everything that you would need, including clothing. Okay, Ms. Sir. Um, think of a couple of, couple of uh, ideas. So one is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Federal Triangle area downtown is where a lot of the federal buildings are. Um, well, that area back in the 1800s was a red light district, um, and apparently it was a very rough neighborhood in ter as well as rough in terms of a lot of uh, safety issues, and I, um, I read something recently, I don't recall what the source was, but basically that some of the police didn't even want to go down there to deal with the folks because it was, people were pretty rowdy. Um, uh, another example is not quite like that. Um, we have a, one thing I did mention is that we have a historic preservation office um, in our agency and they do a lot of work researching um, DC's history. And um, there are actually some uh, old farm estates where the houses um, still exist. These are estates that were in place back in the 17, early 1800s. Um, and they've actually done a survey of those structures and um, a number of them actually still exist. Um, and they found some old photos to, to see what the houses look like. So it's actually really interesting. Uh, I just want to add to that briefly. When I came to the district, uh, because Ms. Stern mentioned the red light districts, uh, CVS Pharma Pharmacy used to be known as People's Drug Store. How many of you in here know that? Uh, that's telling your age, but that's all right. Uh, we're not getting older, we're just getting a little mileage on our youth. Can we field another question from the audience? Uh, let's take this lady here. Okay, I'll be back in next. Hi, my name is Rhonda Bernstein. Um, I'm actually a volunteer with the National Park Service um, at Rock Creek Park and for the Civil War Defenses of Washington. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I'm sorry I missed. Um, the first presentation, um, I was still at work, and I'm looking forward to watching this video, but um, I wanted to just make a quick correction to something that the professor from AU said. Um, Elizabeth Thomas did not get her land back <laughs> after the war. Um, it is the land that is Fort Stevens, um, 
and he fought the government up until a year before he died to get compensation for the land. Um, so I did want to just throw that out there. But um, also, if you're interested in learning more about Battleground Cemetery and um, Fort Stevens, um, Rock Creek does have a mobile app, and you can do a self-guided tour, and I can give everyone the um, link. It is rocr.toursphere.com. Can you repeat that again one more time? R-O-C-R, Toursphere, T-O-U-R-S-T-H-E-R-E.com. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions back there. Let's take the mic to the back. We don't want to leave anybody out. That table in the back, we have two hands up, and then we have a lady here. He'll come to you next. Or he's coming to you first. Or he's coming to you next. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name's Allegra. I really enjoyed the presentation. My question is in regard um, to DC could largely be considered like a town and gown um, area because of the presence of the colleges and universities. So I was wondering if you could speak to the presence of the institutions of higher education in conversations of planning with community members. Yeah, that's, that's actually um, a good question. Um, so yes, DC has a number of uh, institutions of higher education, and in fact, um, a number of them are the some of the largest um, employers in the District of Columbia. Um, they all own a lot of property as well. And so we actually do engage with the universities on, on a number of different levels. Uh, one thing that you may or may not know is that um, every university is required, this is under our zoning regulations, um, to create a campus plan, um, I think it's every 10 years, and um, that's actually something that, that the, the universities are responsible for producing, but they work with another part of, of the Office of Planning or Development Review Division, um, as well as the community, and ultimately they have to go to the Zoning Commission uh, for approval, and a lot of that is really to um, to direct um, how the universities will be uh, moving forward in terms of providing facilities, including housing for their students on and off campus, um, addressing any um, issues, particularly off campus. Uh, there is one university um, in particular that, that where the, this is actually Georgetown University, so this is actually, it's a lot of folks wrote about it, um, and there were a lot of issues with um, students who are living off campus and causing a lot of problems for the residents, um, the, the long-term residents who live there. And so, ultimately, through the campus plan, there were some strategies that were included to try to mitigate that and to reduce that impact. Um, so yes, we do actually interact with the, the universities quite a bit, and we definitely see them as a, as a stakeholder. Okay, next question. Hello, thank you panel for coming out tonight and audience members. My name is Carla. And I have a question for Dr. Sue Taylor about the contraband study that you're working on. I'm wondering, as I look at the flyer, it seems like you're looking for descendants of formerly enslaved African Americans, and I'm wondering how that's going, and if you had the opportunity to locate any, and if so, what were their stories? Well, that's an interesting question, because that's what we started out to do was to try to find uh, descendants of the people who had escaped uh, slavery and come to Washington. They were called contraband. Um, they were named that by General Bill Benjamin uh, Butler, who essentially said they were property. And they were property of war, and as such, you did not have to return them to the en enemy. Um, we tried to find descendants, and we ran into a brick wall, and that's why the flyer is over there. If you know anything about your, your family history, we'd like to talk to you. And I think there are two reasons. First of all, the term contraband, and this was a contraband descendant study. People don't want to be called contraband. And if they're, they think they perhaps were, they're not going to tell you that. And interviewing people, uh, interviewing families, they would always say, but we were free. And they would say it in that way. 
So I'm trying, I was, we were trying to reach out and try to get information on something that was very negative, and that wasn't working. So we've kind of shifted the focus to really look at the communities that now developed and trying to get uh, a different history, perhaps, of the neighborhoods that, that developed around the courts. Okay, can we take the next question? Uh, here? I think I was up next to the public panel. Okay, here you are, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists and to Humanities DC. I'd be grateful for an update on the status of the so-called Klinkle Park. This is an area where public streets in Washington that all of our tax dollars in D.C. help pay for have been closed off for the benefit of a community so they can have a so-called park. But there is no park there. Can you give us an update on what's happening? Who's going to take that question? I can say for myself, um, that is not a project that the Office of Planning is directly involved in. Um, I probably do not perhaps the, the park service, the probably another arm, but, um, so I, I don't have any information about that. I'm familiar with what you're talking about, but I don't know what the current status is. Okay, and I asked the rest of our panelists, and no one here has a response to that. Does any one of our panelists have a recommendation for where she can find out possibly the answer to that question? I'm happy to give you my card, and I can figure out uh, who to connect you to. Okay. <laughs> One second, speak into the mic so everybody can hear you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, you can contact the superintendent at Rock Creek Park um, and excuse it now, but the park, the roads were actually closed because um, one of the bridges started um, dropping um, concrete down on the road below. Um, and so that was part of the reason why but not to make a park. It was a safety Okay, we have another question from the audience. Hands please. We have one way in the back on the left and two on the right. Okay, start there, Jay. I have time. Um, I'm Shelley Moskowitz. I have two comments and one question. Um, in the, the question about mandatory inclusionary zoning, um, I was involved with that about a dozen years ago. Uh, Justice, Justice was very active with ACORN and other community groups. And it was never, uh, it, was a, it was a solution not for the lowest income families, but it was um, to help teachers and uh, people in the fire, firefighters to be able to live in the neighborhoods where they taught and where they worked. And so it was never meant to be a perfect solution, but a piece of a puzzle. And I think to that extent, it took years to get it through, and while it wasn't perfect, I think it's hopefully a good contribution. Is that helpful? And then uh, the other is uh, some mention about U Street in the Shaw neighborhood. I just want to commend a walking tour that is, I know the next one is something like um, April 29th. And uh, uh, Michelle Boston, who's very affiliated, very close to Bus Boys and Poets, uh, she does a walking tour, and it's in celebration of Jazz Appreciation Month and Duke Ellington's birthday. And it's a wonderful walking tour. It was given to me as a gift for my birthday last year. And you get to see all the murals in the neighborhood. You find out about the history of jazz and, uh, in D.C., and it's a very rich experience. Um, so I commend that to you. And then my question is, I understand, well, I know that there are these tunnels underneath DuPont Circle. They opened them maybe 20 years ago for a little while, and then they kind of closed them back up. I understand they're going to reopen, and I wonder if anyone here has some insights of, of what that uh, project is all about. Thank you for being here today. My understanding is there is, a, I think, a nonprofit organization. Um, I, think, I think they're called DuPont Underground, um, but that they're working to to activate that space, and um, and this is I'm just sharing with you kind of what I what I've read. Um, I believe they've made an arrangement to take those uh, translucent balls, kind of like beach balls that the um, the National Building Museum had last summer, 
and to do something with those materials and have some type of activity um, this year. So that's kind of my understanding of what's been going on. But you're, you're, what you're referring to, those were originally um, uh, like streetcar turnaround um, areas. This has been a fantastic conversation. We're going to take one more question because unfortunately our time is running out. But what you can look forward to is that monthly the Department of Humanities, the Commission, puts on a humanity meet somewhere else in the city. So we're going to take that gentleman's question as our final question for the evening. So Ms. Taylor, uh, you said that the War Department owned all those forts until 1925. That's like 60 years after the war, and I was wondering if you've been looking into what were they doing with it for those 60 years. And for Ms. Stearns, the question would be, uh, you said as far as uh, implementation, you know, you don't build the buildings, you don't build the roads. Um, besides buildings and roads or transportation, what other things does uh, the planning department get into? Like maybe like medical services or job training or other city type programs? Do you get into planning that too? Okay, I'm not sure what your your first part of that question was. About. I, it was whether you've been looking into what the war department did with the forts for 60 years after the Civil War for until 1925. Yeah. No, to be truthful, no, I, I haven't really looked into that. Um, uh, we may, but that's probably another study. So right now, we haven't really followed up on that particular. Okay, there was a second part. So to make sure that I understand your question, you are basically asking um, in terms of whether or not our plans with regards to implementation include uh, such things such as medical services, more social services, that sort of thing, just to make sure I got your question. Whatever besides buildings and roads. So typically our plans focus, for the most part, on what we call the built environment. So that includes buildings, includes roads, includes um, uh, community facilities, um, retail amenities, uh, parks and recreation, um, things of that nature. In terms of something for instance like medical services if it's if it's um if we're working particularly in a community where um there are a number of those type of there are facilities that already provide those types of services or people see a need for it we may include a recommendation about preserving um, that access or trying to increase it um but there are certain there are certain things that our plans don't necessarily speak to directly particularly the neighborhood plans i will say that uh, with regards to our comprehensive plan um, it's comprehensive not just because it's citywide, but it actually does cover um, a lot of different aspects of the city. And there is a chapter, for instance, on um, community services and facilities. And uh, one thing that I did mention earlier is that we're about to launch the next update of our comprehensive plan uh, later this spring. And uh, we've actually already started, uh, uh, as an initial step, we are going to be working with our own district government agencies, including agencies in the Health and Human Services cluster, uh, to look at the existing content and figure out what changes do we need to make so that we can be sure that within the landings built environment world that we operate in, if there is some way that we can support access to those types of services, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Let's give our panelists a great round of applause. Give yourselves a great round of applause. Thank you for coming out tonight to the man with the urban plan catalyzed by Benjamin Mays. Extra, extra, you've heard all about it. Montgomery Mays, the man with the urban plan, mapped out structures, forts, and aqueducts, laying out landscapes in this Washington, D.C. land on which we stand now and forevermore. Has it helped? or hindered this city is what this conversation explored while providing insight to the history and learning just a little bit more from our panel of experts. Yes, let's give them a hand. Jay Stewart and the Commission on the Humanities for organizing the man with the urban plan. Forts are now parks. My, how this city has changed grown, transformed, 
regenerated and constantly rearranged to where we are now, while we still have much farther to go. How it will all end up, who knows? But that's the beauty in celebrating 225 years of Washington, D.C. And this ends the discussion catalyzed by Montgomery Mays for this humanity. I'm Dr. Shereen Ward. Have a good evening. basically to help you uh, fund programs similar to these to do further research. This is our next uh, grant series, DC Community Heritage Project. These grants will provide uh, knowledge about the city through uh, historical research. It allows lay people to do uh, their own projects. The DC uh, Community Heritage Project is done in uh, conjunction with the Preservation Office for the City of Washington, and it is a grant period that lasts for 120 days. Uh, it will start uh, mid-June, and the project will end in November, and we will highlight it with the showcase. There are two upcoming grant uh, programs that will teach you the basics of submitting your grant, as well as an oral history primer, a very short hour and a half, the do's and don'ts of how to conduct an oral history. So we invite you to come out this coming Monday, and I don't have my glasses, I believe it's the 11th and the 13th. Uh, one will be in the afternoon during business hours, and the other at uh, in the evening at the Shaw Library, and also at, uh, Tinley uh, Friendship Library. So please pick up a flyer and uh, please come out. You're able to go to our website and register online through our event right. Thank you. Last but not least, I'd like to welcome up Diane Griffin, who's our Director of Development and Communications.
we wanted this year to celebrate Washington, D.C.'s 225th anniversary. We also have our summer youth initiative, Soul the City, coming up. We'll be working with Pulitzer Prize winning journalists to provide opportunities for young people to tell their story and also the story of Washington, D.C. So please support us. We look forward to having you again next month, and thank you all for coming. Well, that ends Humanitini for tonight. Network, make sure you get a Humanitini drink. It's time to turn up. Have a good night.